Hello. Hi. Hi. All right. So um, thanks for being here. I'll give an introduction about. Sorry, I'm uh, eating a straps just right now because I'm a sore throat. So I hope you can still hear me quite clearly. But if if I'm you know rushing or if I'm eating up my words, let me know. I'll try to slow down and I'll speak more clearly. So uh, this is an introduction talk about Manage IQ. Anybody has heard about this project? Oh, quite a few. I'm, I'm glad because usually I come into the room and it's like nobody that like, just look at me like, oh, what's this? But anyway, I hope I can still share a, a bit more info for some of you who already know something, and of course for those of you who don't know about this, um, maybe you can learn something useful from here. So this is like the um, tagline or marketing slogan, whatever. Um, then check you can discover, optimize, and control your hybrid uh, IT environment. From containers to VMs to cloud setups, networks, and storage. <coughs> but first a bit about myself. Um, I started my kind of first uh, foray into Linux and open source was Red Hat Linux back in 1999. And, um, that was even before they were enterprise Linux. You know, it came in, in CDs and in the box, and you buy them off um, computer source. Uh, I joined Nokia in 2002, um, and for most of my career so far, I've been a software engineer. I was working on um, the video video engine in Symbian phones. So if you had a Symbian phone and you played video of any sort, you ran a bit of my code there. And actually, um, I, I mentioned this because um, the video engine is based on an open source cr cross-platform project called Helix, which was supported by Real Networks. So again, that's kind of my, you know, from using Linux to actually developing in a kind of open source um, project with different companies and different people. It's quite a cool experience. And um, so, you know, it got me more and more uh, interested to other open source projects as well. And uh, even though I never really worked in Mego project in Nokia, I was, you know, very in involved in the events and what's going on there. So, well, in the meantime, I moved to Finland, to this part of the world, quite far north and cold and everything. Um, so I've been in Finland for almost 10 years now. And um, so in the meantime, um, Actually, well, after leaving Nokia in 2011, I co-founded this uh, organization in Tampere, Finland, called Devano, where we organized a lot of uh, open source related events. At, at that time, it started with like Mego, uh, Qt type of events, and then it got to a whole Devano summit, and with many you know, open source hardware, open source, different, different types of uh, open source projects, open street maps, and things like that. <coughs> And then I joined uh, the company Yola in 2012. Um, uh, if you guys are uh, probably, uh, some of you have not know it uh, very well, maybe. And uh, it's uh, kind of from Mego, you know, uh, using the MER project core and building on top of that with the Sailfish OS. And earlier on, there's this talk on Asteroid OS, which have um, some of the parallels there using the hybrids. And, some of the same technologies. So I kind of shifted away from development and to more um, reaching out to developers, uh, developer, uh, developer engagement, events, um, and things like that. So that was what I did mostly in Yola. And my successor is actually over there, James. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, that was quite, um, quite also a, a kind of a, Different experience, of course, you know, behind, from behind the computer to more in front of uh, people. So um, then uh, when I left Yola at the end of 2015, I had a really, I, I probably was very lucky. I, I just happened to come across this um, opportunity in Red Hat. They were looking for a community manager for um, this project, Range IQ. And, uh, you know, like, it's it, one of, if you are an open source um, enthusiast, this is one of the probably 
coolest companies to work for. I, I may be biased, but I don't know. But uh, I, I, at, at that time, I was like, yes, you know, this is a great opportunity. So I managed to get a job, and um, here I am today at Force North talking about Mesh IQ. Oh, and um, in, in, in my spare time when I'm you know, not in front of the computers, which is like, you know, out of my waking hours is 90% of the time, but otherwise I'm in front of uh, big uh, instruments, which is the timpani. I've been in timpani at an amateur orchestra. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was actually in Uppsala, Sweden, we had a concert here, so nice, um, kind of something different. So now, um, something about Manage IQ. Um, it has actually been around for a while. It's uh, established in 2006. So, um, and Red Hat acquired Bench IQ in 2012. Um, and, you know, um, took about one and a half years to kind of get the code um, in, in shape and the processes to open source stuff, uh, accepting contributions and the licensing and everything. So it was open sourced in 2014. So, um, and in the meantime, um, there's a, you know, few awards, few, uh, a couple of design summits, and um, of course some milestones achieved with the different uh, cloud providers. Um, anybody knows the Red Hat product name that's based on Manage IQ? Yes? Platforms? Yes, thank you, very good. Um, oh, I, I haven't taken out my, my goodie bag yet. Um, you got a t-shirt later, I'll remind me. <laughs> I don't know if I can Are you Red Hatter? Yeah. Oh, yeah. then you don't count. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. Oh well. <laughs> anyway, no, there will be more questions coming up. <laughs> so um, more a bit about the kind of the technical side of it, which I won't go into much because I'm I'm not really um, familiar. With, you know, I don't code for this project, even though I used to be a software engineer. Uh, it's based on the Ruby on Rails framework, and the UI is uh, largely uh, Panfly and Bootstrap. So. Um, because that, that's a lot, it's a lot of things uh, has to work very fluidly in the UI because it's basically the interface to all the uh, management and uh, organization of the um, this application. So, of course, we also contribute back upstream to the related projects, and there are some side projects, uh, tools, and utilities that uh, support Manage IQ. So if you're interested in more of uh, the, the kind of development side of things, uh, there's our website and, you know, uh, we, we are usually on Gitter, which is like um, the chat tool that's linked to GitHub and GitLab. But I, I'll go into that contact information a bit later on. So um, as a community, we are growing um, slowly but steadily. It's, um, Probably not very well known yet, but we hope to change that. Um, a lot of the um, non, of course, majority of the contributions come from Red Hat, um, but uh, we also work with uh, community partners to develop certain uh, providers or certain features for a given provider. So um, these are just some numbers. I, I need to probably update them soon. Yeah, they, they were <laughs> extracted from a few months ago. But, um, oh yeah, one thing I want to mention is um, Manage IQ used to be just kind of one big monolithic blob of code because it was, you know, um, started with one, one main feature and then it kind of grew. So what we are doing for the past few sprints, we'll be kind of breaking out, um, you know, providers, Amazon, um, Azure, to different, their own separate repos so to make things more modular and more manageable. And we actually discovered that through this process, we are getting more velocity in terms of development. So, um, you know, that also probably makes it easier for people to contribute, uh, especially coming, like, uh, as individuals. It's, it's probably quite, um, how to say, uh, to, to, to face a, a huge project is sometimes quite intimidating. So when things are kind of broken down into parts, it's easier to manage and easier to kind of get started. So. <coughs> And these are just a uh, list of some of our partners. Uh, New Watch Networks, I think now is part of Nokia nowadays. Uh, we work with them on the net networking side. Lenovo recently, we are starting to uh, uh, integrate um, physical infrastructure so you can actually manage uh, bare metal systems with Manage IQ and um, Google, Google Cloud, and so on. 
So, um, kind of like a high level uh, idea of what managed IQ is, is um, kind of, uh, it sits on top of different element managers. So it actually does not um, connect directly to the elements like uh, VMs and containers, but what it does is it connects to the um, element managers like VMware and um, Kubernetes and so on. So, <coughs> So um, through these uh, API connections, and through them, you get the information from the elements uh, through the element managers. So um, you know uh, what it does in the, in the end is to have a unified, one single uh, uh, unified UI to for you to be able to see all the different information about the different elements. Um, and here is a more detailed picture. Uh, of what we support um, from middleware, yeah, popular, Wildfly, to uh, containers I mentioned, to uh, clouds, public private clouds, and uh, also software defined networking and storage. And uh, we integrate with uh, things like uh, configuration management, like um, Ansible and Foreman. So I'll probably mention a bit more about that as well in the later slides. So one of the kind of um, uh, immediate uh, feature that like you can make, make use of in with managed IQ is this what we call self-service. For example, if you are admin of you know a lot of resources, computing resources, storage, VMs, whatever, and um, people come to you, you know, I need this uh, uh, set up with uh, this much memory and this space and. Um, you know, so uh, it used to be, of course, well, depending on the size of your organization and things like that, but, you know, you could manually deploy these um, requests. And um, if you have a lot of requests only coming in all at once, it may take a bit more time. So it's quite dependent on, you know, um, individual's time and uh, things like that. You may make mistakes and um, there's all kinds of uh, factors involved. So, so what self-service uh, gives you is to automate this process. So you can have everything kind of pre-configured pre -configured, um, items or, or um, uh, kind of requests, and then uh, the users can just select, okay, I need, I need these uh, AWS on rail 7 and uh, with this much um, uh, resources. And then they just uh, send the request, and then it's automated. It gets back to them, you know, within the hour or something, instead of taking days for manual fulfillment. <coughs> so, of course, um, automation uh, makes things more efficient. But um, another thing, which is, uh, import is uh, just as important to make it the whole thing kind of um, useful, is the, the life cycle management. What this means is. Um, what happens when all the, uh, the the users are done with it, with the resources? You know, it needs to be decommissioned. It needs to be retired, and the, the life cycle management will have clear ownership of uh, who does what at what time. Like, is it you know after two weeks or after a certain condition is met, you will you know uh, treat the resources appropriately, retire them, and make sure. Um, you know, uh, the next request come in, they have the proper workflow again to manage this. So automation and life cycle management. So this is the, an example of a self-service catalog. Uh, there's more, not, not that many items here, but so you have AWS, uh, Rev, and VMware. And, uh, and oh, another thing that is, um, there's this shopping cart feature we call, which basically means you can select multiple items and you know send in one request for all of them, so you don't have to you know sequentially uh, request uh, certain items. So multiple multiple um, services can be selected at the same time and routed for approval. <coughs> Excuse me. So about this automation um, part. Um, for, for most of the uh, history of the project, 
the automation is done by scripting and it's uh, using Ruby. And you know, uh, it's pretty powerful. You can pretty much, um, depending on what you need, write the script to do whatever. But on the other hand, not everybody, especially um, since that means what, you know, want to take the time or, or is, is a, want to do some programming in that sense, because it is quite involved. And then I think that this whole uh, thick O'Reilly spoke just on this topic alone. So um, uh, with the recent uh, integration with Anspo, actually this, that's the focus of our post uh, coming up, uh, the, the release coming up. You can actually use uh, Anspo playbooks for um, some of these automation tasks. And I think that makes things a lot easier because um, you know you can either use existing playbooks or, or you know you can use uh, uh, make a playbook a lot easier than trying to write some of the Ruby scripts. So, but you know that that's is is you can have two choices uh, however you want to do it. So uh, the scripting is still available. As you know, there's also existing scripts that you can reuse. So um, yeah, so that's. The uh, provisioning part. Then um, the, one of the major features of ManageIQ is this what we call continuous discovery, and um, what it does is, um, as long as it's running, it discovers inventory uh, all the time, uh, the relationships between the VMs, and it also listens for updates. So you have new stuff coming in, uh, new, new stuff gets. Uh, connected, uh, it, it registers and then it displays, you know, your um, new VMs or whatever, and it's well reflected in uh, near real time, <coughs> and uh, it also tracks the data over time, usage data and things like that, and um, uh, there's this thing uh, called uh, smart state analysis, where it actually does an in-depth analysis of um, virtual instances, so you don't just get kind of a surface level information like the VM name uh, and, and the um, hypervisor name or whatever, but you also get uh, details about what's running inside like users, apps, even the files that are available. So smart state captures that. And uh, that's a nickname for smart state. It's called fleecing. You know, fleecing, you, you fleece a sheep, you kind of, um, pull back the wall and expose, yeah, whatever, but, but without, it's not in a destructive manner, you're not stealing, you're fleecing it. So, that's the analogy. Okay. Oh, 10 minutes left. <laughs> okay, so, lifecycle cycle management, as I mentioned previously, um, it tracks um, the virtual instances throughout the whole life cycle, and you can see the history. Um, when it was started, um, whether it was cloned or migrated, and you can do that, you can shut down, you can suspend it. Um, and through the lifecycle management and the smart state analysis, you can also uh, easily track um, causes of problems because you have all the information there, you can find out uh, exactly what happened at this time, what changed, which might cause you know, certain resources to suddenly get consumed uh, a lot more than others and things like that. So, <coughs> and uh, of, uh, also a performance and capacity management, the uh, utilization of resources, and um, um, with the historical code data, you can actually make them uh, make use of them to predict um, usage trends. So for, for new deployments, you can make um, certain recommendations, suggest this is the optimal size based on this scenario and configuration. So um, then you can, you know, you, you won't waste uh, resources so much. And then there's policy enforcement. Um, you can, we can have uh, policy-based compliance checks, um, which is, you know, uh, based on the um, data gathered through smart state analysis. And um, for example, something like the, the drown vulnerability from the OpenSSL uh, uh, issue last year, um, you can uh, you know, describe a policy checking the version of, of the OpenSSL being ran and then 
uh, you know, apply the checks to all the VMs, see which one is having problems, and then a policy is um, constructed of event, condition, and action. So you can you know check when the VM is started, the event, the condition is it does it is it running the correct version of um, whatever patch or you know if it's running then great you can start. If not, maybe you, know, you, you generate a report, an alarm, whatever, or even you know um, um, schedule an uh, update through um, satellite or something. So there's um, ways to deal with that automatically. You don't have to you know check check on the individual um, um, systems that you have. So and and to apply policies, uh, there's two ways of doing that. Um, Uniformly based, you know, like um, the same root user access for all all the different environments that I have on, on my network, or you can say, um, you know, production environments uh, should have stricter firewall access compared to the development environments. So that you can specify different conditions to apply. Mm, okay. Um, <coughs> Then uh, with the usage data and stuff, you can check you know uh, uh, who, who are using what, and you know uh, there's this uh, chargeback thing like how much people are using and uh, whether there's uh, amount involved, and um, yeah, you can you can set the quota by by user, role, or tenant, and then um, the the the. the the stuff um, track being uh, uh, like for compute memory storage and network resources, so um, reports and chargeback information can be generated through my check queue. So all these different features, um, resource uh, tracking, uh, and policy uh, based compliance checks and things like that can be applied to the different. Um, Platforms. Uh, so we have traditional virtualization, uh, virtualized environments like VMware, like uh, Microsoft Hyper-V, like Ovirt, which is the uh, offshoot for Red Hat uh, Enterprise Virtualization. And um, cloud platforms. Uh, um, I mentioned already previously Amazon, uh, Google Cloud, uh, Microsoft Azure, and um, uh, nowadays, the hot topic containers. Um, we have container management through OpenShift, and uh, you can uh, have advanced uh, container scanning capabilities, and uh, you can make sure they're secure through OpenScap, and, um, and make you know uh, manage your, your systems through that way. <coughs> so um, that's kind of the very high level features of what Manchaker can do and it's, I'm just kind of um, bar barely uh, uh, scanning the surface here because uh, it's quite a powerful tool and uh, I realize it's usually for kind of large, um, how to say, um, global deployment of, of uh, cloud systems and things like that so it may not be for like, you know, it's not something I run at home individually for myself but um, I hope that gives an idea. I have some info cards later I will distribute so you can get more information as well. So now I, I go more about kind of the project, the, the um, open source project part. Uh, we have uh, releases every few months or so, six months roughly, uh, based on recent releases. And um, they are named alphabetically. Uh, you can see A, B, C, D, E. Um, is there a clue that tells you why these are, are named as such? Anyone? Chess players. Yes, and chess grandmasters, more specifically. Yeah, T-shirt for you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so th th this is a, our current stable release, which, despite being a short name, is one of the most difficult to pronounce. Everyone? Ew. It's a, ew, ew, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a Dutch name, Dutch, Dutch uh, chess grandmaster. So, um, yeah. So, so, but, but the next release, the F release, is called Fine. <laughs> so that's one of the easiest we have. It's a, it's an American chess uh, grandmaster called Ruben Fine. So we have the Fine release coming up. Um, we, we, we actually we recently had a beta release out. Now we're working on the release candidates. 
So, um, and then we just recently voted for the G release. Let me, let me see if I can pronounce that. Gapritashvili. It's uh, named after Nonna Gapritashvili, who is a Georgian chess grandmaster, and she's the first, first female uh, chess grandmaster. So, long name, but it's still easier to pronounce than this guy. <laughs> <coughs> And then um, this is actually what I do most of the time. Like I said, I'm, I'm not so much in, in the development side of things um, in this project. So I organize a lot of events. I attend events. I, you know, I'm usually more behind the scenes, but I'm starting to uh, get more speaking opportunities. And, um, but yeah, this is our uh, design summit last year. And um, well, lots of people. And what we do for fun, we play chess. <laughs> actually, um, that's our engineering director, and um, he's an avid chess player. Maybe that explains the naming. And um, he's actually playing simultaneously against my, my people, my players. That's a chess simul, and um, he, he beat them all. <laughs> he, he, nobody, <laughs> nobody was able to, to, to uh, defeat him. Um, so, but anyway, so um, uh, it was quite, quite a successful event, if, if I may say, and uh, as my favorite part is always the hallway track. Uh, so, um, and I realized my time is actually up soon. So, so you know, welcome to, to catch me later on and, and chat in the hallways over coffee. So, uh, upcoming events. Uh, we have actually Red Hat Summit coming up real soon. I'm flying back to Finland tomorrow. Then I have one day of rest and laundry, and then I'm flying to Boston <laughs> the next day. So, uh, for those of you who uh, might Go there, we are there with our Man Shaggy booth. If not, then we have also a lot of events. I try to organize a lot of stuff here in uh, the European side, since I'm based here. And uh, so those are some, some uh, stuff going on. Of course, all this information you can get. Oh, okay, one more slide. <laughs> So um, just wanted to say, you know, uh, participating in open source projects is not just about code, even though that's a, definitely a big part of it. Uh, we recently had this, you know, redesigned the um, uh, mascot contest, and um, um, if you remember something about the smart state analysis and the fleecing, you might see the correlation here. So anyway, uh, this uh, came out the winner, and then we'll probably have him, and we will have him. Uh, making his debut at uh, the Red Hat Summit. So, um, how to get more information, get in touch. Um, uh, well, like I said, I have some info cards. That's the best way, just grab one so you don't have to remember all these. But if, even if you don't remember anything, if you remember ManageIQ, that's all you need, really, because from ManageIQ.org, you can you know, find the links to pretty much all of these. Um, of course, uh, we have our code up in GitHub, and uh, like I said, uh, Gitter is our kind of chat tool of choice. We are, uh, we are on our, there is a Match IQ channel on Freenode, but we're not so active there, so Gitter will be more um, um, dependable. You get responses there, we have a talk forum, and then we have um, all these social channels. And myself, you can reach me at uh, this uh, handle sidebat in pretty much most of the social uh, channels as well, although I'm plus Carol Chen at uh, Google Plus because that's what they assigned me. So I couldn't choose my, my handle there. But um, I don't think we have time for questions, but maybe one? <laughs> one. Anything? One, if, yeah, one, one excellent question. We only have 50 minutes and it's uh, the main session. Yeah, well, if not, it's okay. I, I mean, I'm, you know, welcome to, to chat me up anytime throughout the day, the rest of the day. and. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your time. And uh, yeah. and who do I own t-shirts? <laughs> thank you. We <laughs> have a copy for you girls. <laughs> Thank you.